Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 39 of the podcast. And today I'm chatting with Melanie Ham. Melanie is a successful YouTuber. She shares videos on crochet and crafting and quilting. And I really enjoyed talking with her. It's so nice to be able to talk to somebody that does the exact same thing I do and pick up tips. You know, I'm still learning every single day uh, about this craft and learning about quilting and learning about making videos. So I learned a lot from Melanie and I hope that you enjoy this interview too. Now for a few updates about what's going on around the house. I am working on my Express Your Love embroidery, and here it is. Uh, so you can see a picture of this in the show notes if you're listening to the audio. But basically it is an eight and a half by 11 inch, very dense, intense embroidery stitched in uh, both embroidery floss and beads. And it is nearly finished. I am so excited about this. So um, I noticed that I was getting just a little bit of a distortion here where I had uh, really dense embroidery floss. And so I took the entire piece and mounted it on a piece of foam. So this is Bozal Inner Form. It's a really dense foam kind of fabric. And I've been quilting it, basically hand quilting uh, in between the colors of this piece. So that way it stabilized it and it sorted out. I kind of pulled on it a little bit and brought it under some tension to take care of a lot of that um, distortion that I was getting. And then what I'm thinking about doing is putting in some black fabric and creating a border around it. And I might even put it on the machine and quilt it. So I'm not so sure it's completely like ready to be done yet, but the light is definitely there at the end of the tunnel and that feels really great. So I'm gonna sit here and work on this a bit and stitch on it while I talk through the rest of the intro and what's going on this week. So a recent post that you should definitely check out is my collaboration with Margaret Lewin. So Margaret sent me a diamond quilt block, really cute pink and white block, and I got to quilt it. And Margaret was on the podcast a little while ago, and she really is just, she's such a loving, wonderful person. And I decided to tap into that, and I put hearts all over this block and then had a really fun time echo quilting it. So check out her video. Uh, she actually took this block and used it as the inspiration to create a whole quilt and quilt along. So she's gonna be doing a quilt along. It's called Sarah's Quilt. Uh, she, when, I, when I made my video, the name of it was Margaret's Medallion Quilt, and the name has since changed, but I will make sure to link this up so you can see uh, her video. She's sharing the whole quilt. And then I got to help her out with just that one block, but I'm going to do a video in a few months when she's a little further along with her quilt along. I'll do a video just about auditioning designs and planning a quilting design for the whole thing. So definitely go and check that out. It was a really fun collaboration with Margaret. Uh, another thing I shared this week were some tips on picking your fabrics for your Rainbow Log Cabin Quilt and Marvelous Mosaic Quilt. Now this is the quilt along that we're starting in January. So January 2018, we're gonna start the machine quilting party and begin walking foot quilting together. So both of these projects are walking foot quilted and a lot of people were asking me just about fabric choices and that kind of thing. Um, the material lists you can find at leahday.com slash 2018 party. And so the materials lists are there, but a lot of people wanted to know what I was using and all that good stuff. So I shared a video just with tips on picking fabrics. And the really wonderful thing is all of these quilts that we're making next year are fat quarter friendly. So if you have a big stash of fat quarters and you're ready to let them go, <laughs> you're ready to use them up, then this is definitely something that you can use up lots and lots of fat quarters for. And just you now knock out that stash. You know, I love knocking out a big stash so then I can go buy a new stash, you know, because sometimes your fabric tastes change over time. And it's good to be able to kind of clean out the old stuff and then you have a quilt to represent what you loved then, you know, what you loved when you bought that fabric. And then as you buy more stuff, you'll be able to see how your tastes are changing and evolving. And that's really cool. I think that it's good to have a good clean out every once in a while and kind of, you know, get a lot of fabrics knocked out of your stash at once. 
Uh, now, a couple other things I've been working on. Um, I have been making more progress on my fiction novel, and I have a writing friend who's been helping me uh, kind of keep up with writing and setting weekly goals. And so we've been communicating via Facebook. I'll just call her Kay. Uh, and I just really want to say thank you to Kay for keeping me on track and uh, just having that nice, friendly person to talk to about the writing process and, you know, accountability more than anything else. It was a funny thing. I, I never watch the tutorial for anything because I always am so determined to learn, you know, what I need to know and learn quickly. So I'm too impatient to watch a tutorial. So I barely know how to use Scrivener, the app that I'm using to write in. And it was kind of this happy accident that I figured out how to set up the word count tracker and uh, actually be able to know how many words I was writing every day. And, you know, had I gone through the tutorial, I probably would have known that months ago, but uh, it was a happy accident. So now I can set the daily goal to write a thousand words a day. And I realized that my word count had been slipping quite a bit and I hadn't been writing nearly as much as I wanted to. So I'm back on track with that too. And really trying to not write not be so afraid, you know, I, I realized I kind of let the gremlins in a little bit and I was um, just kind of getting a little uh, anxious about my characters and anxious about what's going on and even though I know the plot and I know what needs to be happening, I just need to make everybody do what they're supposed to be doing, I was just getting a little, um, I don't know, just a little worried and scared and a little stuck. So working through that, you know, it's nice to be able to have this weekly check-in and be able to share that with you because uh, it's not all easy. And, you know, I'm certainly in the pro part of the book where it's starting to feel hard. Um, the honeymoon phase is over, <laughs> I guess you could say. And uh, something that's actually really helped is I stitch out a bunny doll. So um, Miss Bunny is a character in the book and I really want to have dolls to make and, and be able to see the characters from the book. So this is my first not so great attempt at creating a doll. And this is the first doll I've ever tried to design. So I think it's, I mean, it's good in, in the respect of like, hey, my first ever 3D thing, I think it's pretty good for that, but it's still not exactly what I was going for. I'm not quite sure what's up with her cheeks. So um, just a little description for the audio. This is an all white doll and she has these really pointy <laughs> cheeks from where the pleats in the fabric came together. And so that her cheeks are really sticking out in a really pointy way. That's a little unusual. Her legs are way too long uh, and skinny and her arms are a little long too. But um, the model for this is actually a bunny doll that I had when I was a little girl that I lost. She was my special doll, the doll I needed to go to sleep with every night. And unfortunately I lost her. And so I'm just kind of going from memory and what I remember Bunny looking like and the seams that I remember being in her head and her body and stuff and just going from memory and trying to recreate that. And I know I have a good ways to go because she, her head was a lot smaller than this. <laughs> So um, it's, it feels really good to be tapping into that. And I think maybe by having the dolls created and working on that too, I can kind of reinvigorate my desire to keep going with this book and kind of get through this hard part that I'm in, which is feeling a little challenging. Um, another thing that I've been working on is machine embroidery. So then I have a new machine embroidery collection. It's ready for you today and you can find, check it out. Uh, you can find it at leahday.com slash modern. It is marvelous modern designs. So it's 25 designs that will stitch out at 3.9 inches square. And the reason it's 3.9 inches square is because a lot of your smaller embroidery hoops, they say four inches. It's actually 100 millimeters and 100 millimeters doesn't, it, it's just, it's kind of the confusing things of going from millimeters to inches. 100 millimeters actually equals 3.9 uh, inches. So if you actually make and digitize the design at four inches, it actually won't fit into the smallest embroidery hoops. And I really want you to be able to, I want the widest number of people to be able to use these and stitch them out. So um, yeah, 3.9 inches. If you want to upsize them, you can usually do that on most machines. And I'm also trying out some new quilt as you go techniques. Uh, so uh, Jindal, 
and she wrote in and shared this awesome technique for using a zigzag stitch. And I'm trying to get Jindel to come on the podcast and talk to us about it and share it. So um, definitely leave a comment to encourage Jindel to sign up for the podcast and come and chat with me because I can't wait to share this technique. I think it's really going to be awesome. It's going to speed things up so much with as far as getting pieces and blocks put together. So I'm really, really excited about that. So that's pretty much it. That's everything that's going on around the house. Uh, just really getting geared up for the 2018 machine quilting party. You know, there's a lot of videos that I need to get introductions made for and uploaded and that whole nine yards. So I've just been really busy with that and really focused on streamlining everything. So that whole event is a lot of fun. It's really easy to follow along. It's easy to find. Uh, and I've been really working on that. So it's, it's there and ready for you guys starting on January 1st. Now, if you'd like to join in that quilt along, just a quick reminder, the only thing that you need to buy from me is a copy of my book, Explore Walking Foot Quilting with Leah Day. That's it. Uh, we don't have any extra fees. The videos go up on YouTube, so they're free. All you need is a copy of the book, and you can find it at leahday.com slash walkingfoot. So that's it for the introduction. Now let's go chat with Melanie Ham about making YouTube videos. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Melanie Ham. Welcome to the show, Melanie. Hi, Leah. I'm so excited to be on the show with you today. Excellent. I am too. So a little introduction so everybody gets to know Melanie. She is best known for her easy to follow video tutorials on YouTube where she specializes in crochet, quilting, sewing, and DIY projects. You can find her online at MelanieKHam.com and on YouTube, youtube.com slash Melanie Ham. She also has a premium course website course <laughs> and that is MelanieMakers.com. So let's get started talking about your business and when when did you start making videos and teaching online? Sure. So I started, let's see, I started YouTube back in December of 2011. So it's been a little bit, it's been, a, it's been a little bit, but I really started it as a hobby. It really, you know, I never intended for it to be a business necessarily. I mean, it's, I kind of thought that would be cool, but it really was an extension of wanting an online community and feeling like I could contribute something and, uh, my sister-in-law was doing YouTube. She was about to quit her job. She does like beauty and lifestyle stuff on YouTube. And she came to visit me and said, you know, she saw all my quilting and all my stuff and my projects. I was making stuff for all my friends. And she said, um, you know, you should like make YouTube videos and put it online. Like it would be so awesome. So I sort of followed her encouragement. And um, my husband does video stuff. So at the time he was in the army doing videos for the military. So I had somebody there I could kind of ask questions and we had a tripod and we had a hand-me-down Canon camera that had HD video. So, you know, I had an iMac that had iMovie on it. So I had some of those pieces. I didn't feel like I had to invest a lot of money to sort of get started. Um, so I sort of just dove in and started it and it just like slowly grew. I had little babies at the time so I sort of just did it slowly as I could and it just kept growing and you know growing enough that I didn't want to quit. You know it's like there wasn't any super you know mega things. I really enjoyed the process. Um, I feel like video is I learned so much better that way and so I felt like the community of makers online that was learning this craft that that was going to help them so much more than still photos on a blog post um so I felt like I was hopefully being helpful at the same time yeah I completely understand so are you a visual learner I am too I like totally. I, I can learn from a book but really I want to see somebody do it yeah totally I feel like uh, you know the, the picture is worth a thousand words you know is so true and I think video is even more <laughs> potentially because you, you get to see so much more information and in the way people move their hands and how they do things that are unspoken things that you can just see visually and it just you know for me it clicks a lot faster and it makes a lot more sense to me yeah I, I completely understand so now at this point is it easier for you to go and shoot a video than it is to shoot some photos yeah for sure for sure. I would say I'm a mediocre photographer. 
for sure. I, you know, there's times where I have to really fiddle around with it before I get a picture that I like. Um, just because I do feel like my expertise has become a little bit more video tutorials. I feel like I can do that in my sleep. You know, I can, uh, the flow of it is sort of like second nature at this point. Um, understanding what parts to make sure to include so that people aren't lost on certain steps and all of that kind of stuff is like just after a while when you've done it a bunch of times that sort of um that repetition just is helpful but taking pictures is still a little bit tricky sometimes oh I completely agree so uh at this stage you know you've obviously developed a lot of of quicker techniques and editing and stuff what are some tips if somebody wanted to make a video what are some tips that you would help them get started with Yeah, you know, I think people really, you know, a lot of people ask me this, and they are so nervous. They feel like there's this huge gap, and there's really not. You know, there's a couple of key things, and I feel like so many people can make great videos. Um, The biggest thing is to use some sort of stability device like a tripod or, you know, you don't want to be holding on to your camera and you're it's shaking and you're trying to hold your iPhone really still and it just that's not going to work especially when you're trying to show somebody visually a project um you know if you're talking to the camera like at you know at an event or something that's acceptable but you know when you're really trying to show something a tripod I mean and you can even do it on your cell phone I mean I, cameras these days on our smartphones are amazing so they have little tripods for your phone really easy and so if you can do that and you can have decent sound so that people can really hear what you're saying there's really a lot you can do with just having those two pieces be as as on point as possible with the tools that you have there's no need to go invest in a fancy camera or a fancy microphone or fancy lighting you can use a window and daylight And as you kind of get used to it, then you can slowly invest in some of those other things. Um, But good sound and stability in making videos, um, really being clear about what you're pointing to so people can really see and understand. You know, I think so many people could, could make great videos with just some of those tips. Certainly. So what's been your favorite video that you've created so far? Oh, you know, I love my quilting series. Um, It's a couple of years old now, but that series nearly killed me because I did it really quickly and I was sort of, I put the pressure on myself to try to keep up and and really deliver those videos pretty quick. Um, But the amount of feedback that I've gotten from that series in terms of how helpful it's been, um, I think that's been my favorite because I've gotten such great feedback and it's been so helpful for people. So I think that's probably my favorite, probably the introductory one, probably my favorite where we kind of like get started. That one's always very exciting for everybody. (laughs) Not everybody gets to the end. Um, But if, you know, it was helpful and a couple people learned some new things along the way, you know, I'm excited about that. I completely agree. Yes. It's so important. And it feels so good to be like, I am helping you get started and jump in at the very beginning. And that's that's really rewarding to know that you actually helped somebody make that quilt. And they couldn't do it before they watched your video. So uh, what you have a really super popular channel. I mean, you have almost 400,000 subscribers. Please tell me how you did that. <laughs> oh. oh, man, you know, I think a couple of things is, uh, consistency. You're, you're really consistent on your channel. Um, consistency has you know, been key, I think, for me. Um, also, something that's shareable. Um, a lot of times, like when people get excited about a project and then they share it with their friends, that's something that sort of helps to kind of get followers. And then I, I had a couple crochet tutorials that really went you know, semi-viral, I guess, you know, they have a few million views on them. And I think that really helped to get, you know, lots of subscribers, but that's more on my crochet side. So there are definitely some more viewers on the crochet side, but I love quilting so much that I've just, I wanted to keep including all of it on the same channel and not split it up or do two different things. And it's sort of, um, uh, you know, I love quilting. Quilting's my favorite, actually, you know, with my crochet too, but the crochet, You know, a lot of people love that, and some of those projects can be a little faster than the quilting. I think sometimes quilting is a little uh, intimidating at first, 
<laughs> for people, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't. But um, I've gotten that feedback sometimes. And some consistency and just trying to get better and trying to improve and trying to get, you know, you know, better equipment here and there as I go and try to make it as professional and engaging and very um, no judgment. We are just practicing. We're just trying, trying to have that sort of feel to it so that, you know, because beginners feel very nervous a lot of times when they're first starting new, ta- new, uh, new projects but new skills. And so I think um, that's something I struggled with when I was learning, feeling like I didn't know what I was doing and I felt really dumb and I was like, this should not be that hard. And I felt defeated at times. So I understand what that feels like. And I try as best I can to um, communicate to my audience that that, um, that that's okay and that that's totally normal <laughs> and that you, you will, we, we all feel the same way when we're trying to learn a new skill. So Hopefully, all those things combined have kept people coming back and and taking a look at my videos and and um, yeah, it's crazy how how many people are out there. <laughs> Half the time, I'm like surprised by that number. <laughs> it's it's amazing, it really is. And I was kind of like, I wonder if Melanie will even email me back. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. I mean, when you see a number like that and being a YouTuber and stuff, sometimes it's like. You know, you look at numbers and stuff and compare and that, you know, comparisonitis kind of can set in and stuff. And I was like, I've done a thousand, you know, over a thousand videos and I, you know, I have a quarter of your followers. And so there is that, that sense of comparison can sometimes get me stuck. I'll be completely honest, but hearing what you're saying, I'm doing the exact same things. And I think the only difference is I I picked a really niche topic (laughs) to then make a thousand videos on and that probably is the source of 90% of it. You know, I mean, like free motion quilting, the intense, dense free motion quilting that I love. There's not as many people that like that as like super chunky crochet. And I mean, your crochet videos are amazing. You know, I've, I've looked at those and, you know, uh, some of your blanket tutorials. And I know you're saying that crochet is a little faster and easier, but to me that I'm like, my mind is blown. Like, how can you make a whole blanket in one tutorial? How do you do that? Right, yeah. Well, the, the, the fun thing about the crochet process for the tutorials is, like, I'll film a step in the morning, and if I'm working on a crochet project, I'll film a step, and then throughout the day or in the evenings, my husband's home watching a movie or whatever, I can work on the project on the couch or with my kids when they're running around and um, get to the next step. And then I put it aside, and then the next morning or whenever I get to that next step that needs to be filmed, then I'll film that piece. And then later that day or that evening, I'll get to the next step. So it's kind of one of those, um, it helps my project. You know, I like to keep my hands busy, so when we're watching movies or, you know, something that's easy to do two things at once, um, I like to work on that. And that sort of helps to keep the flow going without having to stand in my studio and try to like crochet really fast to get to the next step. It kind of is helpful to just break it up that way. Um, and then in between I can work on other things, you know, there's all sorts of other tasks to get to. Um, and when you're running an online business and, and teaching and interacting and social media and the whole thing. So that sort of helps to kind of keep it going so it doesn't take too long. But there's some of my blankets. They've taken me three weeks before I can finish the video and actually then edit it and get it ready to go up on YouTube. So some of them, um, I don't do big ones anymore for YouTube because <laughs> they just take too long. But the, the baby ones, those are so fun, and I can get those done pretty quickly. Awesome. Yeah, that completely makes sense. Now, do you do any kind of scheduling like, you know, a month ahead, two months ahead? Do you do anything like that looking uh, long term or do you plan everything just kind of as you want to make it? Um, I would like to say that I schedule things more, but the truth is that I don't. <laughs> I'm a little more reactionary than that. Um, and it ends up being requests that people have. Last year, um, I got so many emails to do a messy bun crochet beanie. 
I mean, I was like, every time I'd open my email, I had another one. And so that wasn't in my plan for those kind of fall and winter videos. I sort of have a list, like a running list of highly requested topics or things I want to do or stuff I'm going to make for myself or for my kids. And I roll those into videos. Um, but I got so many requests that I sort of put everything else aside and made that right then. Um, and you know, that video did really, really well. So, you know, being able to sort of be nimble and kind of just sort of go with what's happening or what's kind of um, people are asking for at the time is great too. So I try to plan out a little bit, but it seems that life gets in the way a little bit more often than I think it will. So I sort of have to kind of go day by day sometimes. Yeah, I completely understand that. I have gotten, you know, I've, I've kind of gotten the reverse. I got a little stuck almost because I was planning so far in advance and I was planning these like year long quilt alongs and stuff. And, it, it, you know, and it oftentimes, I mean, that was great and it worked out really, really well and it was successful. And I love quilting along with people that way. But I can start feeling trapped by the project almost like, can I just get done with this block so I can go and do, you know, like the thing I want to do? You know what I mean? So I think that there is kind of, there's there's two sides of it definitely and I think that how you're doing it and posting kind of as you see the trends I think that's honestly a probably a better way of doing it and that you're certainly being able to follow your passions is that how it does it feel like that for sure yeah yeah I think I agree with you um I love that I own my own business and I can work from home and I can go on my kids field trip if that comes up or I can help out a friend or I could not work that day or I, you know, I love the freedom that comes with that. So things where I feel too, you know, tightly constricted by my schedule really is difficult for me. And my husband's schedule is very up in the air and all over the place. And I can't always count on him for school pickup or other things that, that I kind of need to be responsible to do. And I just, I really, my kids and my family and my, my home life comes first. So I, you know, I try my best to sometimes schedule things, but I really do a lot of times feel very, because uh, I feel a lot of pressure and I want to deliver, you know, what people, what people have, it's a quilt along, I've done quilt alongs too, and by the time I get to the end, I'm like, oh man, I mean, I love them, and they're, they're, the interaction is like nothing else, but by the end, it's really difficult to sometimes keep up, because I have, I made a commitment to them and they made a commitment to me and I need to hold up my end of the bargain. And I, I feel a lot of pressure and I feel a lot of responsibility to do a really great job. So by the end, I'm like, Oh, okay. Not so many people are relying on me to get this group of videos out. You know, it feels like a little bit of the, the weight gets lit up a little bit and it's nice to sort of have my own, um, posting schedule. I've always, you know, people always say posts, regularly on YouTube, you know, the same days every week. And I've tried so hard to stick to that. And I just, I can't. So, you know, there's things that come up or videos take longer. And I feel like I, I am a little more organic that way. And I think people understand that. And, and, uh, and but that's okay to them too. Like every time I sort of express the, those feelings of like, oh, I'm trying to get this out. I'm trying to get this done for you. And most people are like, it's okay. Like, you know, the projects are, they'll be there. Like we're good, you know? So that's a, you know, my audience is amazing and they're, they're so sweet. Um, but yeah, that, that scheduling thing is tricky because you also want to have a schedule and be able to plan things out and be able to know, you know, that the schedule allows freedom in a sense too, because you know exactly what's supposed to be done that day, you know, exactly what's coming. So there is, you know, a, a balance as well. Certainly. And I'm so happy to be talking to you about this because I go through the exact same struggles. It's like, I feel like I'm talking to like my alter ego, <laughs> my like video making quilting twin. <laughs> it's so <laughs> wonderful. Like somebody else that gets it and understands like it can be really hard sometimes to feel like I got to go make that quilt. I got to go work on that. I've got to go get that done. So that way it's ready and I can edit it and have it ready to go on Monday. And it's like, and then like my kid gets sick and it's snotty and like bringing that cold in the house. And it's just, sometimes it can feel like a struggle to balance it all. So it's wonderful to hear your experience. So um, do you ever feel like you have to give something up in order to do this, in order to make certain tutorials? Uh, like, just for an example, a lot of the quilting tutorials that are online, 
you know, there's steps that kind of get, get skipped, like, you know, pre-washing fabric or starching fabric and stuff. That's something that I'm like, eh, kind of anal about. And so I always do it in every single video. But I could certainly see how if we got too busy, like that might be something I'd be like, uh, we're not going to pre-wash fabric on this video just to speed it up a little bit. Is there anything like that that you just have to kind of say, can't, don't have time for it? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> there's, um, there's, you know, when you have a list of things that have to get done for a video, you know, sometimes if you're going to take on something else, something else potentially has to come off, you know. And a lot of times I think um, you can edit around uh, things that aren't finished. And I have done that. I did that the other day. <laughs> I didn't actually finish quilting my quilt, but these videos had to get up. So I just showed the part that was done, you know? So there have been times where, you know, it didn't matter to the video to see the entire quilt finished. My integrity was not compromised in saying that there was something done when it really wasn't true. It didn't really have relevance to the video. Um, the next videos, it needs to be done, you know? So there's, you know, some of those things where it's not necessary, you know, potentially for that one video. Um, but I always verbally like to include as many steps and as much as detail as possible because that was something I was frustrated by when I was learning. And some of those details like pre-washing, pre-washing, not pre-washing, uh, different types of thread, different types of batting, you know, people just like did it. And you were like, well, what about all these little details? Like you don't, like people just sort of, once they've been doing it for a long time, you just sort of do it. And so it's sometimes, you know, you're not sure those little nuancey things, like as you get going or some of those little details or some of those pieces that can really like help somebody. So I try to, for the sake of like, for example, a lot of the, some advice I've gotten is, you know, try to keep your video shorter rather than longer. Although now the YouTube algorithms change, and so longer now is better. Although I mean, you, you can't keep up with all of those things. But for a while, I was like, well, I can't make it shorter because I'll be leaving out key ingredients. I'll be leaving out key things that people need to know. And I would be frustrated if I watched this video and it was like going so fast that you couldn't even keep up with what was happening. So there is a part of like your point of view and how you teach and how you, you know, that there are going to be things that have to be included. And then there's maybe other times where you can skip a step as long as the integrity of the video is all still there. Um, and you know, it just sort of depends on the situation, but there are, there are times where I have cut corners for the sake of getting something done faster, or I'll do like a mini version. If I want to teach a technique, you know, I'll just do like a small, little version rather than like a full size blanket or a full size project because I just, I can't fit the time in to finish all of that. And those hours in between that aren't even on video, that's not really helping anybody. It's just taking up my time. So there's, you know, a little bit of back and forth, but I definitely think that if there's any key ingredients people feel like need to be included, that they know that in their heart, that, that they'll, they'll, you know, you have that little voice that says, I don't know, like, and you know, when you, when you have that little voice, you have to listen to it because by the end you'll be unhappy with the full result of the video. And so, you know, sometimes there's compromise with that too. Certainly. I, I love that you're on it. So honest with that too. And there have been times I've cut corners and then I've totally regretted it. And then there's other times I'm like, well, I got away with it. Let's keep on moving, you know? And it just, I think you just have to go with it, you know, and make it work. Um, so you have started a premium course website and that is melaniemakers.com. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that. How does it work? Yeah. So, uh, you know, one of the things I was noticing in terms of how running an online business is, there's um, not a lot of ways to take care of your person, like take care of your tribe. And some of the ways I wanted to kind of take care of my tribe a little further was to do quilt alongs and courses and much more in-depth stuff than I could really put out on YouTube. So sometimes the YouTube videos, they were just taking too long and I really just was not able to continue doing super long in-depth quilt along style stuff on YouTube for free. So um, I decided to create a premium website, melaniesmakers.com, and it's like uh, a place where you can go to do that next step. Um, go, 
it's still all video tutorials and I um, any comments or things that are done through there I I prioritize those comments above all my other social media so I feel like I can I can take care of people a little bit better if they have specific questions or they need a little bit more hand holding or they have some um, little hang-ups as they're going along they have a little bit more access to me versus a YouTube comment that I'm not always able to answer or always able to get to and then I can kind of take care of that community a little bit better so um, that was something I've been really excited about how it's been turning out it's been um, very well received and everyone's been having a blast kind of participating in those classes and we have then a private Facebook group for all of my course members and everybody can kind of interact and share not just my project they can share just whatever they're working on um, but that's been a really fun addition to uh, my uh, you know my capabilities as a creator and as a maker and helping to take care of my, my people. Certainly. So what is the deciding factor, uh, whether you put a video up on a on your uh, content sign on your courses as a course or give it away for free? Like what's the deciding factor? What makes the split? Sure. So I always want to be able to provide free content on YouTube and on the blog that that I feel like is where I got started. And I feel very strongly to continue doing that to some extent. Um I also feel like, though, as part, you know, as a YouTuber, you get, you know, a couple pennies per view. It's really not a viable um, source of income in terms of being able to continue it full time. So there's some of both. There's a lot of times my smaller sort of technique videos go on YouTube. I'll do full projects on there as well sometimes just to kind of mix it up and still make sure that I'm taking care of my overall tribe rather than the, the smaller tribe that's sort of invested in my courses. Um, but if it's something that's more detailed that needs several videos where I have to put together like a, you know, big PDF and I make patterns and things like that, then oftentimes I'll have those be for sale. And I, you know, I price my products so that I feel in my heart, like I'm giving it away, you know, so I really try to make sure that I, I'm not, at all hesitant about the price that keeps everything very affordable and keeps everybody happy but it also helps to supplement some of those free content you know things as well because I'm able to do more of those when I have other income sources coming in and you know kind of helps to kind of create a more well-rounded uh, you know business but also be able to take care of people and and make sure that I'm providing the sort of content that is helpful Absolutely. I do the same thing. I call them video workshops. And it's, you know, I look at it as exactly what you said, when I want to go in depth, and when I want to show something step by step, sometimes it can be an entire quilt project start to finish. And you know, you know, I, I've had experience with putting that on YouTube. And sometimes people don't, they don't stick around to watch all the videos. And I feel like, well, you know, maybe having that investment and paying a little bit will make you, um, take it more seriously. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah, for sure. You've got some skin in the game and you've invested some money and you'll finish it. You get a lot more finished products and finished um, projects that people have created and that have then spent that time with you that love you and that then understand what it is that you're teaching all the way to the end. I mean, I definitely think that's totally true. A series of videos and a full quilt along on YouTube, it just, it's not necessarily the platform for that. Um, but technique videos, quick tips, um, shorter projects, and then some, some bigger things thrown in there as well. It is, it's a great platform for that, for finding new people to bring into the tribe and then be able to take care of them on a deeper level as they've determined that they like your style, they like your projects and what you have to offer. Um, but it, going in depth on YouTube is just really hard, you know, these days. I think you, you want that viewer to stay with you through the whole video, but if it's not quite what they're looking for, they click out and they, it's very distracting to be on YouTube sometimes. <laughs> There's so many amazing things to see. So yeah, I love that, that mm -hmm. idea. 
Excellent. Well, so uh, one thing I've been focusing on a lot lately is great work. So uh, good work, great work, bad work. You know, it's kind of like looking at what you're doing every day in a different way. So good work is like the work that pays the bills. It gets the job done. Uh, great work can do that too, but it's also that special work that means more to you, that feels fulfilling. So what to you is your great work? And do you feel like you're doing a lot of that every day? Yeah, you know, um, when I'm in my studio, I feel like it's great work. Even if it's a project that was a requested project, even if it's something I didn't kind of like come up with or that's for me or my kids or something like that, I feel like that's where I want to be. When I'm sitting at my computer with, you know, emails and answering comments and some of that kind of stuff, scheduling social media and all these sort of things that have to get done, um, but my soul does not feel as, as uh, satisfied when I'm sitting at the computer and I can really only do it for so long before my studio is right in the door behind me. And I, it's like, I, and my computer is like across the hallway. So I'm like, I want to go back. I want to go back in there. <laughs> can I please go back in there? So I love, um, just creating and that process of making, I love going on, uh, I do live videos every Monday on my Facebook page. I love the live interaction and kind of being able to quickly answer questions and, and demo a project. I love that interaction. I feel like that is very fulfilling in terms of, um, instant gratification. Somebody had a question, they got an answer right then and there. I can demonstrate it real time. So I love that. And, you know, pretty much anything I can do where I'm in my studio or, uh, you know, working with my hands or making something, you know, I feel really happy about that. Um, but that the computer work's got to gotta get done too. And that's part of an online business. That's part of trying to manage it and deliver it out there. Editing is very important and it's all, it's, it's important work and it's necessary, but it's not always as soul feeding <laughs> as the actual making part. Absolutely. I completely agree. Well, I know I could sit here and talk to you for at least another hour about all of this stuff, but this is the question I always ask everybody, and that is, what are you looking forward to most in the next five years? Oh, in the next five years. You know, I, I've i often had big dreams, big goals for my business, and sometimes, you know, let's bring it back and simplify. You know, sometimes it's, it's like, I've got this I want to do on this I want to do and move forward, move forward, move, do, do this, do that. And it's just like, you know, amazing projects are really where it's at. Um, it's not about owning a new line of this or opening up a shop or having all these other things happening. You know, a lot of times that ends up being a lot more headache. So I think, you know, just simplifying, I'm looking forward to in terms of my business, um, just being able to reach more people with great projects and be able to inspire them to make something for themselves that, you know, inspires them, uh, not only with their capability or their possibility. I just love that, that interaction, especially with beginners that really can kind of flip that switch and really understand like, wow, I can totally do this. I just, I love that so much. And so being able to do more of that is, you know, so amazing to me, you know, on a business level and, and kind of keep doing what I'm doing, but just slowly kind of grow it out. Um, and, you know, personally, you know, just spend as much time as I can with my kids, my aunt, my husband, and um, I'm just looking forward to living life, you know, and the, those daily mundane things sometimes, you know, my daughter the other day, she's like, it was Halloween, she said, Mom, can every day be Halloween? It's like, well... No, because then it's not special, you know? <laughs> we have these things that, you know, it's really special to be able to have this freedom in an online business that can allow me to do lots of things with my family, and I really just so appreciate that. So, um, you know, living life, let's, you know, let's buy a house, let's <laughs> do all these kind of normal things that are just what life's all about. So that's what I'm excited about. That is so wonderful. I wish you the best of luck with all of that. So let everyone know where they can find you online. Thank you so much, Leah, for having me. I'm so 
honored to be able to talk to your audience. And yeah, come come visit my blog, MelanieKHam.com. That's really like a good one-stop shop. There's a tutorial page where you can see all of my free tutorials, like the blog posts and the YouTube videos that go along with it. There's also a link right there to my premium course site. And I've created a coupon code. So if any of the people listening would like to put in the code Leah. Um, L-E-A-H, then you can get 20% off off any of my quilting courses, um, whatever is available at the time. Sometimes things come and go, um, different quilt alongs and things like that, but whatever's available, when you check it for like the next year, you can get 20% off um, of anything you'd like to make. And that's sort of the best place to find me. I'm on Instagram, Facebook, all the good social media sites and all that fun stuff. But the blog is probably the best kind of like Go there first and you can kind of check some things out and see what you're interested in. Excellent. Thank you again for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at leahday.com slash podcast. We have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilts.